interrupted, right? Buy a business or start a business and then go through an exit. And there's a lot of moving pieces with a lower middle market M&A deal. Accidentally, I forgot to record the very first intro of my first episode on the show. Today, I'm talking with Bruce Marks. He's a certified M&A advisor and author and the senior vice president at First Bank of the Lake. Resumed. There's um, a lot of, of unknowns uh, that go along with it for first-time buyers. And I felt like I had a lot to contribute in that space. I, I went to school. I got an MBA. I went back later, went to school and became a certified mergers and acquisition advisor, went through a course to be, you know, learn how to do business valuations, owned my own business, was a senior lender in a bank. And I just felt like all of that experience could help folks that are looking to acquire businesses because I thought I, I, I always tried to provide value to them and not make it about me to be truthful. And when you learn how to give back, what happens is, is if they're successful, you're successful. And so for me, it was taking all of those experiences, wrapping it up, so-called putting it in a ball and then helping searchers, which is primarily what I do, you know, find, well, I don't find them, but help searches who do find the right target to get it to the closing table. What's the first thing that you would like to uh, uh, tell your younger self before starting your acquisition journey? So I was recently quoted in the, in the Wall Street Journal, and I think that this is, for me, what I would tell my younger self if I had to do it all over again. And if I had to do it all over again, I don't think I would do really anything different, which is, which is really something because I think that um, in this space, it's just um, a great place to, to play. But to be successful, you have to specialize. You, you have to become a specialist. It's kind of like if you go to a doctor and he's the brain surgeon, right? He's the specialist. And then you become an expert in your specialty. And then once you become an expert in that specialty, then it's just letting the marketplace know what it is that you do and what it is that you don't do. So you don't yourself be put into a position where you can't best be utilized and provide value to your target audience. So for me, people who reach out to me do so because they know what I can do for them. And it's a great place to be because I don't get bogged down by loan requests for real estate acquisitions because that's frankly not what I do, right? I don't get bogged down with, I'm looking to expand my business. Can I get a loan to do that for inventory and whatever? I, I've let the marketplace know what it is that I do, what my specialty is, what my expertise is, and that allows me to fulfill my day with doing the right type of transactions that are going to benefit the folks that do come to me. What are the resources that have helped you along the way? So you meet people that mentor you. You meet people that that change your life. Recently, I, I um, had a book published along with Jack Canfield called The Keys to Authenticity. And in that book, I explain about the folks that have come in, in, in my life that are still part of my life that helped me to get to where I am. Everybody needs some, some help. Everybody needs some training, some teaching. And there's been a lot of folks along the way that have helped me get to where I am today. Um, and I think the key is, is, is finding, like I said, that niche, your specialty, having an affinity for it, then becoming an expert in it so you can help others achieve their dream, right? It's kind of like the payback of, of what. And I've been doing this for a long, long time. Um, I've closed, you know, well over 1,250 SBA transactions during my career. I've, I've helped a lot of, of people. It's, it's great to 
Last year I went to a, a Christmas event and it was being catered by a, a, a really terrific small business restaurant style. Um, and it, it turned out that I had financed that business you know, 22 years prior and helped them get into business and, and was in, and basically gave them the loan to start their business. And here it is, you know, they're super successful 22 years later. And it's, it's very rewarding to be able to meet folks and, and see the fruits of your labor and look at other people's success. Because when you learn in this business, it's not about you. It's about the people that you can help, the people that you can influence, the people that you can basically be impactful with, that in itself is extremely rewarding. Okay, so once we have specialized in our sector, and if someone wants to acquire business and is looking, looking for some businesses to acquire or even invest in, what are your specificities uh, to uh, ensure that this, this business is right for me and to acquire or even invest? Yeah, great question. Glad you asked. For me, when I look at a business, it starts with the sustainability of that business. You know, how long, you know, just to the basic cores, plus he's, how long they've been in business. What do they do? Why do they do it? How do they make money? Why will they continue to make money? Is this a, a need business or a want business? What are the things in the business that I don't know? Why is the seller selling? What does he know that I don't know? And basically you drill down into, if this is a very good business model, what can I do with it? But first and foremost, is it sustainable? Is it going to make it? Is it going to last? Um, you look at you know all kinds of businesses. For me, you know, people always ask me, well, what's a great type of business to buy? I, I happen to personally love roofing businesses, and I'll tell you why. Let's say you come home one evening and you open up the door into your home and the roof is leaking. Whether you want to or you don't, whether you can afford to or you can't, if you're living in that home, you've got to fix that roof because... If you don't, there's going to be tremendous consequences that will come as a result of not fixing that roof, right? And we don't have to talk, everybody I'm sure knows what those are. But to me, that's a sustainable business because it's a need business. And if you've got a problem with your roof, it's got to be fixed. Whether this guy is doing it or, or that lady is doing it or that company is doing it, doesn't matter. It, it's got to get fixed. So... When I drill down, and even when I look at the types of businesses that I would invest in, the type of businesses that I own, it's the same when somebody comes to me and asks me for a loan. Because the last thing that I want to do as a lender is make a loan, be responsible for a transaction, and it not work out well while that person is personally guaranteeing and putting their young life on the line for this business venture. I don't want that to not work out well. So for me, it all starts with the business, the business model, the sustainability, and why that business will be arguably three, five, seven, ten years from now. And another thing I would love for your, for your audience to know is it's, it's not just about that time period. Because when you buy a business, you are going to exit it one way or another, whether you want to or you don't. You are going to exit, either through sale or through death or through passing it on to a family. You're going to exit. So you want to make it on your terms, hopefully. That's why people buy businesses. They buy them to build them, grow them, sell them, and, and hopefully sell them for more than what they bought them for, right? Adding the value. And so the key to that is, is making sure that that business is going to outlast you so you can have your liquidity event 
and realize the fruits of your labor. It's not just about, oh, I serviced my SBA loan, I pay it off, and then what do I do with it? No, you want that big liquidity event to set up for, you know, your future. And that's, you know, and, and in the search fund ETA space, it's a phenomenal space because that's truly what it does. It, it, it creates wealth, it creates value, and it, it's impactful and it changes people's lives. I mean, it's, it's real. Okay, so once we have made the list of businesses to look, look for and uh, approach them, how, how do we set up a meeting with a seller in the interest of acquiring their business? Yeah, so most, but not all, but most businesses, when a seller realizes it's time to, to sell the business for whatever reason, generally they're going to reach out to a business broker. And the business broker is going to come to market with that, that sale. Kind of like if you own a home and you want to sell it, you, you hire a real estate agent and they, you can sell it your own, on your own, but nine out of 10 people are you know, using a, a realtor to, to sell their, their home. And so business brokers are generally the folks. And there's all kinds of business brokerage sites and you, there's Biz Buy Sell and there's Bowfly and there's With Como and there's, you know, a ton of, of sites out there that sell businesses. Now for the, the, the person that wants to buy the business, it's very important to distinguish yourself when you're meeting with a business broker. Because as I saw on the platform X this past week, buyers are a dime a dozen. There's just a ton of buyers out there. And there's a lot of businesses that are, that baby boomers are looking to exit, right? And so, but there's more buyers out there than, than people looking to exit, right? Because you've got this whole younger group of folks that want to create wealth that understand the CTA program. And so you really have to distinguish yourself when you're working with a business broker. And how do you do that? In today's market, it's not just do you have the money to, to, to pull off the transaction because you can go out and get investors. As you know, that counts as the down payment. So really what you have to do, not only do you have to sell the seller that you're the right guy, it starts with selling the business broker that you're the right person and you're the right buyer and why. So if you don't go and you don't prepare enough about you, and listen, every day we get up, we're selling. And the first thing is, is you're selling yourself. And when you're selling yourself, you never wanna misrepresent the goods, right? You wanna be truthful and you wanna put out there why you're the right buyer for this business. And it's generally not about how the deal is structured. If the buyer is working with the business broker and he realizes that the only thing the business, the seller is, his key component is the price, that he's gonna to sell it to the person that comes in with the highest price, right? If it's, I wanna make sure that my name stays on the door, then most likely, they're gonna have a different buyer than just the guy that pays the highest price. Maybe that's a private equity group that's gonna come in and maybe take the guy's name off the door. So that wouldn't be. So to me, when I go out and talk with business brokers about listings, I ask them, I don't know the seller, I've never spoke with them yet. You have, you're representing him, I know that, not me. What are his three most important things that he is looking for to who he chooses as his buyer? And I don't think enough people know to ask that question because then you can find out exactly what the key points are of the seller and then you can find out if it's a good fit for you. Maybe the seller says, I want somebody to come in and help run the business but I wanna roll 25% equity and I'll personally guarantee the loan and I'm looking to, to basically take 
75% of my chips off the table, but I want to go away for four or five months and I'll just kind of be an advisory. And you don't want a partner. And that's not the right deal for you. So the first thing you have to do as a buyer when you're dealing with business brokers and trying to find the right one is ask, what are the three key components for the seller when they're making a choice of who that buyer will be? Make sense? Yes. Um, but uh, once we have set up a meeting and uh, set up a deal uh, and how to negotiate the price uh, if you ask 30 times what his business is actually worth, yeah, and a lot of times the, that's how good the business broker is in setting the expectations with his seller. Remember, the business broker represents the seller. So when you're dealing with a business broker, and a lot of business brokers today, I, I had lunch with a, a close friend yesterday. She owns a, a brokerage firm, and we were talking about it, and she'll do a valuation on that business that's coming to market. And remember this, that if a person buys a business and they're going to seek financing, a bank is going to require an independent third-party business valuation to determine the price. So I'll, I'll put it in really easy terms. I decide that I wanna sell my home. And I say to you, I wanna sell my home for $500,000. But the market says, hey, Bruce, the, the, the house is only worth $350,000. Well, a couple of years ago, I took out a big home equity loan. And so I owe $475,000. So I need to get five hundred. dollars Yeah, but the market has come down. And, and when the, the appraisal is done, it's only worth three fifty. dollars Well, that's what it's worth. So it doesn't matter what the seller wants. To your point, if he wants 10 times EBITDA, uh, unless he's in the pet space, most likely if he's in the manufacturing or if he's in a home service based type of business, he could want it, but he's not gonna get it because the marketplace is not going to allow for that. And if he needs financing, the lender who is required to get a third party independent business valuation when they hire that person to do it, it's not gonna flush out. So it doesn't really matter. And so a lot of times to answer your question directly, it's educating that seller what his business is worth and why. And then the party to do that. Let me give you an example. I've had clients come to me and say, Bruce, I believe this business is worth 3 million the seller believes it's worth four million. What do we do? We're a million dollars apart. Okay, go get a third party independent business valuation. They'll tell you what it's worth. You sign an agreement to buy the business for what it's worth. He agrees to sell you the business for what it's worth. You get that third party independent valuation. They determine the value. You buy it, he sells it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Good. And, uh, once we have set up a price and agreed on the price and terms, how can we uh, determine that uh, we, how can we assure that uh, the uh, business we are buying is a zero down deal and we, ha we are putting little to no or no money to buy it? Because that right. happens so, in the market a lot. Sure. So <clears throat> at least with SBA financing, and even not with SBA financing, any bank is going to require you to put down some equity. So let's say, you're a, a person who is going to be a searcher and you're going to search for the business and you really don't have any money yourself. You would then go out to investors because the minimum that you would have to put down, if the seller holds 5% on full standby, you would have to put down 5% as equity. So let's just say you're going to buy a $2 million business and you say, okay, I need 10%, 200,000. The seller says, I'll hold 100,000 on full standby. You need 100,000. That's the requirements. If you don't have any money, you go to family and friends, you go to investors, maybe you pull out, maybe you have a equity in your home, maybe you bought a home, it's, you paid 250 for it, now seven years later it's worth 500. You can pull out 100,000 in home equity 
right? Use that as your down payment. Leverage people that you know, but it takes money to make money. So to think that you can go buy a $2 million business with nothing down, it can happen if you have nothing, but that doesn't mean it's nothing down. Yeah. And what's the biggest tip uh, in your industry that you would like to share that have helped you across your way and, and your life a lot and worked every time for you? What works is when you have a willing buyer, when you have a willing seller, and you have a willing lender. If people... If sellers are drawing a line in the sand saying, I only want this price, I, I am sticking to that, whether the business is worth it or not, that makes it tough to get done. If you have, I, I've had transactions where I've had buyers and it's a philosophical type of thing. I know this seller wants $3.1 million for the business I think the business is worth 2.9. I'm not giving them the 3.1. And I'll say to them, okay, let's just talk about that. You've got a $200,000 differential and maybe that business is throwing off maybe $800,000 today, right? So close to a four multiple. He wants 3.1, you wanna pay 2.9. And I'll say to buyers, you're talking about a $200,000 difference and if you're getting a 10-year SBA loan and you're amortizing it over the 10 years, you're talking about $20,000 a year. Do you want to give up buying an $800,000 EBITDA business for $20,000? And most people will go, I, I, I didn't look at it that way, Bruce. And I go, I know. Because you're drawing a line in the sand when you shouldn't. So there's a, a quote from Warren Buffett. It's my favorite quote of all times, only because I live it every day. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. And it's where that value proposition becomes more than the price that you pay. And so what's worked for my clients, not for me, because this is not about me, is when I can help them Structure a transaction that works for everybody at the table. It works for the seller. It works for the buyer. It works for the lender. It works for the broker. It works for the employees of the business, right? Um, there's a lot of purse strings being pulled at that small business. When a loan closes, that business is now responsible to pay the bank. It's responsible to pay the seller. It's responsible to pay the new buyer enough for him and his family. Its responsibility is stayed the same in that it's got to service its customers. It's got to pay its employees. It's got to pay its suppliers. It has a community reputation. When you look at all of those things, a key component to that is buying a business that you're gonna love and that when you open the door of that business, if it is a business that actually has a location, that you're gonna love what it is that you do. I've got several, several quotes that I've learned over the years and one of them is, you know you love what you do when you'd rather be doing it than not, right? If you have a choice today to get up in the morning and on a Saturday, come in and do a podcast. There's one reason you do it, because you love it. You, and, and I do. I, I, I love what it is that I do. And that's why I do it. I don't have to do this anymore. Um, I'm very blessed and very fortunate. I do it because I want to do it. I want to I wanna be impactful for others. And I think when you're looking at being a buyer of a business, and all the responsibilities of that business, the one thing that you really need to understand, setting up from success to go back to my first point, becoming a specialist, becoming an expert in that specialty, 
and then letting the marketplace know what it is that you do and what you don't do. As a buyer of a business, you better love that business. It's not just about buying cash flow. You should have an infinity for it. You should, because I've seen people buy businesses and they thought the business was great because they have great cash flow. And it's not. And they're coming back a couple of years later going, I, you know, I made a mistake. I, I, I think I bought the wrong business. And they're, and they're selling it, right? So I think all of that, I know that's a lot in answering your question. But when you're drilling down and trying to find the right business, I think you would be remiss if you didn't take my comments into consideration as you're trying to find the right one. Okay, so what's the acquisition that you thought in the mind that this was the thing I was waiting for in your career? What's the acquisition that you loved the most in your career? One of the, one of the acquisitions that I thought was just phenomenal and one that I never knew would have existed was several years ago, a searcher said to me, Bruce, I've, I've got a business that I'm looking to purchase. It's in New York City. Um, the purchase price is $5 million. It's throwing off, at that time, interest rates were a lot lower. It's throwing off about a million two fifty. So just about, you know, a four multiple. Okay, what do they do? It's a dog walking business. I went, what? A dog walking business. A woman started this business five years prior. She was walking a neighbor's dog because the neighbor was out of town. And somebody in the apartment, she lived in a large apartment complex, saw her and said, oh, isn't that so-and-so's dog? Who are you? And she said, oh, I'm, let's just say Sally. I'm Sally and I'm walking so-and-so's dog because they're on vacation for a week. And the woman said, I'm going away next week. Could you possibly walk my dog? And she was like, okay, how much do you charge? They worked it out. Somebody else saw her. She gets the second dog. She gets the third dog, the fourth dog. Now uh, she needs help. So she grew a business. She had 25 dog walkers in her stable servicing several apartment buildings and condominiums in downtown New York walking their dogs. And I'll never forget when I brought the deal to the bank, my boss at that time lived in downtown Chicago, had a dog and utilized a very similar service. And it was just, I'm like, wow, I didn't even know that kind of business existed. And it was just an unbelievable, I didn't end up doing the financing, another bank did, just to be transparent, but it was one of the best business, simple model, and obviously the key was finding the people to walk the dogs, but just a business that was great, no cost of goods sold, no overhead, no just, you know, just employee expense of walking the dogs, and, and that to me was just an unbelievable business, and it was a great business, and like I said, unfortunately, I, I did not get to finance the deal. Some Another bank did, but it was a great business. That was the, the one of the most interesting ones I've seen. Bruce, what's the thing that I haven't asked yet and you would like to uh, tell in this show and share in this show? I think you asked a lot of, of great questions for your audience. I, I think that I've, I've shared with them the majority of the points that I, I would want to get across. Um, I'll just maybe end with my, one of my favorite quotes is, is today you're the best at what it is you do, but tomorrow you'll be even better. And each and every day we gain experience. Yeah. And for folks buying a business that they think they are going to be super successful in it at 27 years old, when they're 37 years old, 
There's a lot of things that happen over that time. I get a lot of folks that come out of school, BETA program, and immediately heard about search and want to jump in. The thing that I would just like to say is there's no teacher for experience. There's a saying, I wish I knew then what I know now. And I always say, you can't because you haven't lived it. You haven't experienced it. And experience is the best teacher. So I would say, have vision for what it is that you want to buy. Get experience. Learn how to manage people. Learn about the industry that you want to go into. Become a specialist. Become an expert. Let the marketplace know what it is that you're doing that you don't do. And I think those are the keys to be successful. And what do you think your viewers can find you well on this episode? Yeah, so on the what was Twitter platform, which is now X, my handle is at SBA B Marks, S B A B Marks. And they can always reach out to me through my my bank email, which I'll be happy to share, which is B Marks at FBLake.bank, B A N K. B Marks at FBLake.bank. So either way, I'm super available. Um, would love folks to, to follow on Twitter. I write every Saturday, War Stories Saturday, as you know. And these are stories, true stories about SBA transactions, good, bad, and different, um, and, and tips for, for folks to find value and hopefully helping them along their way. Okay, so it's a wrap. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for having me on. I greatly appreciate it, and I hope your audience enjoyed the tidbits I had to share this morning.